this episode, we read Getting Gamers by Jamie Magdigan. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. I'm sorry if I didn't actually do that. Uh, let's just go right into this. This is another psychology book about video games, which I have tended to really, really enjoy, but this one, not so much. Uh, the major problem I have with it is it covers a bunch of issues and it doesn't do any of them like really in depth like I would like to see it. I prefer the books that take like one of these subjects and really do like an in-depth analysis on it. He tries to do that and he breaks the book up into four parts which is nice, but it just didn't seem to work out too well for me. Uh, if you guys want like a nice reference and some information about each of the different things that he talks about, that's great. I mean, it, this this book would definitely do that for you. But for me, I just I wanted more out of it than what was actually there, or at least I wanted more of the parts of it, and the rest of it I, I was just sort of like I could do without it. Now, as I said, the book is broken up into four parts. Each of these parts covers a different uh, part of gaming. So, for example, it covers uh, gamers, it covers the games themselves, it covers the developers or the people that make the games, and then it also covers the sellers. He focuses a lot on digital sales here, which I understand that's sort of really the thing that matters more for most, uh, most of what you see in video games. The, so digital sales could be like on Steam, it could also be like on Amazon, or any way that you would get the game in really any form. Uh, what he does with that one is really kind of special. I like it how he sort of compares it to retail, which is nice. It gives you something that you can kind of compare it to, and it's m more realistic than if you just talk about it in isolation. It r probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, now the book doesn't really feel that much like a textbook, which is great because you know nobody wants to sit here and read a psychology book that's going to be read in a class for a while, and it's a little bit more friendly to the average person that's going to read this. I've read some of them that have, some of the books that are just really way too much like a textbook for a casual reader. This one is closer to that the experience of being just like a casual book, but. A lot of the things it talks about, in my opinion, are done better in other books where they give more time to like one part of the book that one part of what this book is talking about. Now, to say that's really like a super bad thing is not really true, and I'll get more into the parts that I dislike later as well as some of the things that I really like. But right now, I just kind of want to focus on the book in general. Now with it being broken up into four parts, it creates like a nice way of just, you know, being able to take a break from the book. So you can read one part and then set it down and go on and read the next part later on. Which I kind of had to do for other reasons, it, it, not really that important, but I kind of got caught in a rainstorm and my copy of the book got a little water damaged and I had to wait for it to dry out. But yeah, whatever, that happens. Now. When I say you can like set it down and everything, I really do mean that. Like you can skip around in this book and not like miss anything. Because he talks about each one in isolation or each one sort of in its own specific part, you can just read that one section and get whatever you want out of it and then later you need to find like a reference or something along those lines and you can skip to the section that you want and read that. It's a nice way that the book is sort of broken up. It doesn't, in my opinion, affect the flow very much. But, you know, it's just something that you should really know about if you want to go into this book. Also, honestly, I found that the first ten chapters were pretty good, and I liked them quite a bit. The last five, which are kind of the last not really two parts, but like part and a half of the book. I, I could have like done without those. I didn't really find them all that necessary to be in there. It, it was just my own personal opinions. If you do read this, you might find it different. 
Uh, but, you know, that's just my own thoughts on the book, and at least the last part of it. That was the only part that like, really, really seemed to drag for me. Now, what I really liked about the book, and this is something that I really want to emphasize, this is the part that I really, really liked, because when I get to the next part, the parts that I dislike, I might get a little bit more angry, but I'll try to keep it as, uh, as balanced as I can. Now, the first couple of chapters, they go over basically, like, uh, the way some developers dealt with, like, toxic environments in their video games, sort of the communities around them, and it's kind of the balancing act that they had to do in order to measure, like, free speech, but also keeping the game sort of that fun place for everybody to go in. Nobody wants to go into a place where they're just, like, spewing racism or yelling at you. Uh, that was kind of interesting for me, but it just it felt a little bit weird, but that's mostly because I didn't care at all about the games he was talking about. Uh, then they get into like nostalgia and fandoms and also kind of like a high score thing. These three chapters, uh, might have been four, but I'm pretty sure it was three chapters, those were all really, really cool. Just the way that they did it, it, it was really great. And they, the way Jamie brings in a lot of the different examples and everything to tie it all together, especially examples from outside of video games, to kind of make things a little bit simpler, just in case somebody that picks this up isn't really into video games and doesn't know what he's talking about. He brings up a lot of other, a lot of psychological studies that were done sort of around the ideas behind like nostalgia, behind different fandoms, and when he means fandoms, he, it's basically like anything that's following a specific product or following like a sports team and those sort of analogies like that. Those are really, really cool and they really help you sort of understand the different ideas behind it. Uh, he does go into a few other things that are in that which I don't quite care about. Uh, he goes into high scores, which personally I don't think matter anymore, and it was kind of a weird thing to add in because it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me why it was there, but it's still kind of cool to see the psychology behind it and see how you know some leaderboards are still in effect and they still sort of push people ahead in games and whatnot. It's just those first couple of chapters really hook you in. At least they hooked me in and made me want to keep reading. Now the last thing I wanted to mention here in my likes section was about the sales and everything like that. This is a really cool thing that he points out and it makes a lot of sense, especially since he tied it into retail like I mentioned earlier. He talks a lot about JCPenney's and how they tried to do away with sales back in, uh, I think it was 2012 or something like that. I don't, I don't really remember this, but I don't shop at J.C. Penney's anymore. But it sounded like a really stupid idea when I was reading the book because if you get rid of sales abruptly, then you know people are going to freak out, especially all you regulars that are used to constant sales. Essentially, uh, there was some sound logic behind it, as Jamie points out, because they were basically selling basically everything that they were selling and all the money that they were making, all the products they were moving, they were selling all of that stuff on clearance. And so all their money was being made on products that were marked down and usually severely marked down. So their profit margin was like very low on everything that they were selling. It's almost like they were giving these things away in a sense. It's not 100% true, but it's, it's very similar when you look at that. And then he shifts and like pivots over to sales on video games and kind of how those work. Basically looking at a failed example of getting rid of sales and then explaining the psychology behind why sales work. He talks a lot about uh, GOG.com's Insomniac sales, which I had never heard of, but I'm not that big into computer games. I maybe buy like one or two a year and it's not necessarily through GOG. A lot of times it's through Steam. And so the Insomniac sale was kind of crazy where they'll randomly throw one game on sale and essentially it'll be on sale until they've sold a certain number of units of that game. 
and then they'll just move on to the next game. So you'll have to sit up at your computer all hours waiting to see if a certain game comes up, or waiting to see, like, yeah, kind of waiting to see if a certain game comes up, or hoping to get a game aimed that you actually want. It's kind of a weird thing. Uh, it makes a lot of sense, and it's not really something that I would want to do, though, but that's... Again, that's just me. I'm old and grumpy now, so it's... I don't want to stay up all night waiting for a game to come on sale or anything like that. Now, what I really did not like about this book, and... I, I want to say, like, none of this was like a deal breaker for me. None of this made me want to just throw the book down and say I'm done with it. But it, it was still really, really annoying. Uh, he... Jamie uses too many examples. And I know I said I like the examples he used, and I do, but often he would use like two or three examples that were outside of gaming that I couldn't really see how they related too much, or they were already making points that he had made. So he was just reinforcing a previous example with another example, and it was just like, yeah, I got it, you told me this, can you move on to like how this applies to something else at this point, or... I, I honestly wanted to yell at him, yeah, you made your point, just move on. But again, that's me reading this. You could have a different experience with this. Uh, I would say, like, some of the examples were really, really weird. Uh, they made sense eventually. It just kind of took a little while to get there. And some of that's because Jamie throws in some humor and whatnot just to kind of break up what's going on here, because he didn't want it to be super dry, where you're just reading facts over and over again. And this is where it kind of comes into another problem, where some of his humor, I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I didn't need that in there. You, you didn't need to write out, like, four sentences about how, it was just weird, like, he would write out sentences that was like, oh yeah, keep reading, or, you know, this might be a good time to go review my book on Amazon, or something like that, and I'm like, I... Why did why did you throw that in there, Jamie? I I don't need to I don't need you to do that. If I was going to do a review of this on Amazon, I would go do that. You writing it in your book is not going to make me want to go do it. If anything, it's going to deter me from going to do that. And yeah, that, that's just kind of how I felt with some of the things he threw in there. I will say some of the examples were a little bizarre that he threw in. Uh, aside from the humor and everything, some of the examples were kind of bizarre at first, and it really makes me question parenting in the 1950s when I read some of it, because I only know about some of the weird out there psychological tests, the ones where they're like, okay, this is going to set an example of why you're no longer allowed to do this sort of thing anymore, where it brings up major ethical questions. The ones that he talks about in the 50s just bring up, like, freaky, weird parenting questions where it's like, yes, Mr. Man in the lab coat, you can take my child out into the woods for 30 days, or however long the experiment was, and give them knives to play with, and we'll just see what happens out there. Just bring them back when you're done. We expect most of our child to come back. If he loses something, it's fine. I'm assuming they all sign waivers for this, but dear God. <laughs> Now that I've gotten my random rant out of the way for this wonderful book review, which I'm sure some of you enjoy me doing that, but, you know, oh well. I will just kind of say this overall. This was not a book that I enjoyed for this entire episode, and it's kind of a shame because I thought there was a lot of potential in it, but it just sort of... Something in it just kind of, like didn't work for me, it just didn't click. Maybe it's because Jamie focuses on everything, and in my opinion, when he focuses on everything, that means you don't do anything very well, at least that's what I was always told when I was writing. I don't know if that always works out, but you know, it, it could just be that I'm a terrible writer. I mean, that's very, very possible, and most likely probable if you've ever had the misfortune of reading one of my books. So, I will just say this, if you're really interested in this, check it out, but do it with a, take it with a grain of salt, and, you know, 
don't necessarily take my own opinion as as, uh, as gospel. Just read through the description yourself and decide if you want to read the book on your own. Anyway, guys, I know I left you off with that weird wishy-washy thing, and I'm sorry, but that's just kind of how I feel about this book. It's not great, it's not terrible, it's just okay. So anyway, uh, thank you guys for watching. Uh, for the next episode, we are actually going to revisit a series that I didn't really realize was a series but until I read the first book, at least I hope it was the first book. But uh, we're going to go back to good old Jared Hansen, and we're going to read uh, The Symbolism of Zelda, a textual analysis of Wind Waker. I read another one that was on Majora's Mask that he wrote, and that one was kind of interesting, so hopefully this one will be interesting as well. Anyway, thank you guys for watching, and I hope you all have a great day.